Well, blessings to your church. Excited to be here. I mean, I, I usually come once a year, and then actually, like, it's a great way of staying connected. A couple of great things have actually happened so far. First of all, as I was looking at the couple, I know I'm going to get back to you, okay? So the, you guys actually okay, learned, the, learned the lesson, so now the flowers are given to the point. But uh, this one was so awesome. She's like, are you sure you got to go? Are you sure, sure you're going to go? Sure. Okay, fine, let's go. It was funny. So... So basically, you made, it to, you made it to the second service. You actually like, you braved up to be here. So that's all legit blessings to you. So number one. Number two. Are you guys excited to be here? Yes or no? Yes. yes so uh, I'm going to use uh, Pastor Vasilio's trick and say, uh, it was kind of weak. Are you guys excited to be here? Yes. See, these guys, I'm going to be preaching to you. And for the, I'll forget about you for a little no, it's got to be for everybody because it's an excitement that we have together as we actually come together as a church and then as a church family. Exciting, exciting, exciting because we believe that God is present in this place. Amen? And that he's present in this place in a very, very powerful way. This is why actually every time where God shows up, he does his work and miracles happen. Do you believe that? Because, if, I mean, if we don't, then we have a very low view of God. Because if we think that he blesses more on Sundays, he forgets about people on Mondays. He starts thinking about them on Tuesdays. He clicked in, I mean, after the weekend on Wednesday. He's kind of, you know, go, go, going full speed on Thursdays. And he's ready to party on Fridays. You are mistaken, right? He is this same every single time in every single pla place. Amen. You know, it's going to be a little, maybe a little bit different message. Uh, I promise you, you'll forget about me for about a year or so, so I can do anything I want to. So, and then with that being said, by the way, I granted permission from here. A great, couple of things I want to say. First of all, I will, I mean, I promise you, by the time I'm finished, you're going to be very hungry for Jesus, of course, right? So, so number two, okay, number two, may I ask you to do something right now? You've already done it, but actually this time, I will ask you to do this I mean, to at least four people sit next to you or very close to you, okay? Would you please turn around and with the best attitude ever, would you please actually say this phrase, God cares for you, he loves you, and he hears your prayers. Would you please do that? Say it to at least four people. God cares for you, he loves you, and he hears your prayers. God cares for you, he loves you, and he hears your prayers. God cares for you. And he loves you, and he hears your prayers. God cares for you, and he loves you, and he hears your prayers. God cares for you, and he loves you, and he hears your prayers. Like okay, God cares for you, and loves you, and okay, loves you, and he hears your prayers. And especially this message to you, okay, to the balcony. God cares for you, and he loves you, and he hears your prayers as well. Because that is a foundational truth about actually looking at when we think about God and his presence, we need to understand that he is not presently distant. He is presently present, right? Amen? You know, he is with us. And actually, I mean, that will define the whole big topic that we're going to be talking about today. And that is called time, time to live. It should appear on the screens. The PowerPoint should be all ready to go. But time to live. You know, as of right now, we are experiencing this life. You know, and then there's a big difference between existing and living. You know, there's a professor at the university that every single year, at the beginning of the school year, he would ask the students, you know, how old are you? For how long have you lived? And people would say 20 years, 18 years, 23 years. And he would say this, no, 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 no. I'm not asking for how long you've been breathing, but I'm asking you how, for how long you've been living, cherishing the moments. The, 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 you live when you've got something to remember and you want to go back to it. So life determined not only by breath, even though it's physiological life, but life is determined by the relationships. Amen? You know, that's the different kind of life that we're talking about. And today, yes, we are talking about evangelism. You know, it's one of my, okay, one of my calling, actually. It's my main calling to be an evangelist, pastor evangelist. You know, as a, kind of with the apostolic giftedness, meaning just planting church and seeing the movement, doing the missions. And I'm so glad that we together can be doing this as a church, okay, as a church and the Choose Life Ministries. But that's an exciting time for us to be able to see how people are living. You know, I'm going to give you a couple of moments, um, a couple of stories, but let me read the verse. Let them read the verse that is written in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 21. So Philippians 1, 21. 
Paul is saying this tremendous truth. The big truth, he drops that big bomb on the church and he says this. For me to live is what? Who knows? Christ and to die is gain. You know, it's different. It's, 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 it's a thought that is counterintuitive. Because what often means actually for me to live is to live and enjoy and to die. I mean, I would rather die in Christ. But Paul changes this picture big time. He says, no, 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 no. Like, you know, for me to live is Christ. That's the relationship that I have. And it truly, like, as we are watching his life, we have seen how it changed him. He was a very big religious fanatic, like, a bit that was actually persecuting the church. Him and he was actually wanting the church to be overdone and gone, yet God saved him to the point that actually he wasn't just saved and be happy, happily saved, sitting back into his city. No, 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 no. He was running like crazy, sharing the gospel, and actually teaching the whole other people to do that. And here's the thing, quite often when we talk about evangelism, we always think about methods and projects where in the reality it is a lifestyle. Amen? Evangelism is a lifestyle, not a project. So don't, put, don't shove, it, shove it into the project zone, meaning I'll do it one time, three times, five times, ten times, uh, ten times a year. Even though, even though, let me tell you, some projects are great. Projects are awesome, right? We're talking and praying right now with, okay, with you, dear church, dear good news. That actually, we would be like doing ministry together in Mexico a couple times this year. We'll be going to Katowice and other places in Poland as well to do ministry there as well. So projects are great. And then if you don't know to how, evangel how to evangelize, how to share the gospel, how to pray for people and in prayer uh, to be able to actually share God's news and give people hope, you know, we invite you to come on the projects because you can learn this way. You know, there's a prayer process and everything. We'll talk about this probably next Sunday. But the thing is, you know, projects are great to get you a boost. But projects or evangelism is a reflection of the depth of your relationship with Jesus. That's the big bomb. It's not the bada bing, bada boom, bada bomb, right? By the way, I was not speaking in tongues. So, so when, you, when you think of this, when you think of this, if, if, if evangelism is a reflection of my relationship with Jesus, then allow Christ to speak, in, or to speak to you. Because remember, he cares for you, he loves you, and he hears your prayers. That's the big story. And actually for Paul, as I mean, he really laid his life down for, this, for the sake of sharing the gospel. Because he learned a lesson that... When it comes to love, like in a, there is no such a thing as a free love, right? Yes or no? Love will always cost you something. You know, the couple was here. At least it cost the, like, the bouquet, right? The cost of the bouquet was there. Was that expensive? Was it good? No? Okay. Send us a couple of links. It looked awesome. So, but the thing is, but the thing is, love will always cost you something. Your love is sacrificial. Love is actually, it's not me for me. It is me for somebody else. And let me jump into this true definition of love because we're looking at this first right now. But the true definition of love, the true love or agape love is not based on the character, nor the performance, nor the attitude of a loved one. But yet it is actually rooted in the character of the one who loves and if somebody would say, well, I mean, he or she did something, and then I don't love that person anymore, this is what it means. It's not that the other person was, was bad. It is your love was shallow. Because love is not about a performance. It's about a commitment, dedication. It is a, it's a crazy love. It's a selfless dedication. It is a sacrificial love. It is covenantal relationship. And Paul has experienced that love. This is why he says, for me to live as Christ. The one who gave everything to me and to die is gain. Because gain in Christ's death was ours. It costed him everything. Our God who loves. And yes, as we talk about evangelism, you know, again, there is a, it's a different, bit of a different spin today on this message. Because actually our evangelism is not rooted, rooted in the methods even though they're, 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 they help. 
But evangelism is rooted in a relationship with Christ. Amen? Nothing more, nothing else. When it comes to evangelism, evangelism doesn't start when you go there, but evangelism starts every single morning when you get on your knees and pray to God. You know, God, would you please open, open my heart, open an opportunity for me to, do, to share your word. Evangelism is actually showing up at work about 15 minutes earlier or before your appointment and actually pray for the meeting, pray for the people that come. You're going to pray for the people you're going to be working with or the customers you're going to be serving. And you say, God, please open an opportunity for me to see the need that I can fulfill. And then through that, just to show you, reveal yourself to the people through me, God. It may cost me. It costed you. Father, would you please do that? 15 minutes, literally, if you show up before your appointment, 15 minutes, you know, and he's going to start praying about the appointment, first of all, that will be much more efficient. Number two, your eyes would be open. Because evangelism isn't just a thing you do at the end of your journey. Evangelism isn't just something, well, I go to work, I go to church, I do this and that and this and that and this and that, and then actually with the time left, then I'll do something, I'll participate in the project. No. Your family is the place for evangelism. Yes or no? Yes or no? Absolutely. Your neighbors is, is the place for evangelism. Yes or no? Absolutely. If a good neighbor cooks steak, Pastor Vasily is known for that, right? Evangelize him. <laughs> he does an amazing steak and lamb and everything. But, but, but when it comes to it, I mean, it's got to cost you. Evangelism is when you go to work and you pray for people. Evangelism, when you participate in the projects. Evangelism, when, when a friend of yours calls you and then you are actually, like, you know, you are being, you are being open. You're not gossiping. You are actually there to help. Evangelism isn't just like, you know what, I'm busy. Like, you know, I'll get back to you. Evangelism takes different forms. But it usually focuses, is focused around one heart. That's it. And then Paul says, for me to live is Christ. Jesus said it, about it, uh, said it about himself. I am the way and the truth and the what? Help me. Life, right? Amen? You know, this is so much life into it. And actually, I've seen so many examples, so many times as the, like God took me to different places, different countries, starting from locally. There was a time that I worked as, the, as a driver for... Um, Okay, for the town car, the limo transportation, and then another four and a half years doing Uber and Lyft. And the thing is, I mean, for those 12 years put together, man, I've seen a lot of people, shared a lot of actually hope with them, pray with them. We'll be sitting there crying together, giving up the Bibles. They will be actually accepting Christ. Not every single one of them, of course not. But the thing is, even sometimes when you think that your life sucketh, sorry. So, so basically, you're like, you think that actually it's not just going to kind of click this way. That everything is bad, and then you actually go and start sharing the gospel with other people, and then you will see how God is touching their hearts. And even though that your day was miserable, but actually when people are opening up to Jesus, man, you're just going to light up like crazy. It's life. There is no way you will ever get used to seeing people come to Jesus. There is no way you're going to get used to seeing people to be baptized. There is no, never you'll get used to seeing, seeing people to say, look, I would love to serve. Never you will do that. It brings you life. Because here's the thing. This is the big truth that we need to understand. That from the moment of the conception, every single one of us is an eternal being. We are going to be living forever, but death will define where we're going to be living, where we're going to be spending the eternity. Because, look at it, Jesus gives us, look at him, just uh, walking, uh, please uh, pray for me as I'm walking here, right? It's just, it just uh, I'm like between life and death right now, so. Whew, I'm going to live. So, when we're praying to Christ, we're opening our hearts to him. When we confess of our sins, the new life begins. But actually, but when we're living for ourselves and we're dying in our sins, we, even though you may call it life, the abundant life, whatever it is, no. Without Christ, there is no life. There's only just existence. And this is why as we're looking at this, we need to understand that actually there's a big difference between living a full life and merely existing. And now let's going to bring this, uh, look at attention, let's start to define what this life is all about because again life isn't just a spectrum from the conception then coming together then living the life and then just kind of like a kind of like a fading in your ears and then being being actually put in a grave no it's not that it's not just that moment no life is much more than that life 
is rooted in the relationship. Because here's the thing. Let me, let me ask you the good question. So, okay, we are people of different ages. But do you know, actually, right now, sometimes we may, we may feel like we're going through hell. Yes or no? Sometimes it's really difficult. You know, as of right now, as we're praying for our loved ones, like back in Ukraine and Belarus and Russia and different countries, man, this is like hell is going there. And actually, when everything is aching, you're not living. I mean, everything is just kind of aching inside of you. You can call it life. You don't define life by your pain. But at the same time, that actually, if in the midst of this, um, these treacherous conditions, if there's somebody whom you can trust, somebody who can rely on, somebody who can open up, you cherish those relationships. You, like, live again. And so basically, this life that we're talking about is the same way. The life is defined by the relationships you have, not the conditions where you live. Because relationship will either make your life or break your life. Can you be rich and miserable, yes or no? Raise your hand if you are this way. We'll help you to get rid of the riches <laughs> and live a happy, free, happy life. You can be poor and happy, yes or no? Absolutely. And you can be poor and unhappy or rich, or rich and happy. You feel like you're living the dream. And then I've seen a lot of people through doing the ministry, like, and then locally and globally, kind of this way. So people live when their relationship clicks. Because here's the thing. You may have everything in the world, but when your love, loved one is dying, you're not living, you're dying. Right? You're sympathizing. Everything is breaking. It is really difficult. So this is why when we talk about life, when we talk about the evangelism, we need to understand we need a relationship that will never die, will never fail, will never run away, will never betray, will never trade, okay, will, become, will, never be, um, will never betray, will never set you up. Like in, like in that kind of spinning motion. And that relationship can be found nowhere else but with Jesus. Amen? This is why we're talking about this life. Christ is offering himself as the source of life so that we can trust him. And that relationship with him will determine what we will do for him and how we will live this life. But it really, really is going to take us to the place of big transformation. A big transformation. Let, let, let us open Romans chapter 12, verses 1. Look at, and look at in 2. We'll be able to see that. Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Can we say this together? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Let's do it together, but now let's do it louder. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Here's the thing. It sounds great. And by the way, for us as Christians, by the way, that's going to be a very honest and open sermon. You know, sometimes as Christians, we actually fail to execute God's commandments. Because quite often, actually, here's the thing. When the truth is good for us, we will comply with the truth. It is only when the truth is going against what we want, this is when we're going to, be, when we're going to start fighting. You know, so many people even call it, well, you know, like, you know, everybody is against me and people are just attacking me and attacks are coming to my way and then everybody hates me. Here's the thing. If you are in the wrong relationship, if you are in the wrong relationship or, you, or, or, or you're cheating and people are telling you, it doesn't mean that people are against you. They are telling you the truth that is not comfortable. We like the truth that we have a good time of walking in, but we don't like the truth 
when it provokes us or tells us that we need to do something that we don't really want. Because at that point, we really need to adjust our lives or often what happens, we stop coming up with the excuses. It is easy to recognize the truth when you are not living in attention of it. We need to understand that actually when it comes to the truth, when we receive it, we try to define it. But here's the thing. We came up with, with a great crafty tactics of blocking certain things and making certain truths of the Bible, even for the Christians, to be not so truth or not so relevant or not so urgent. For example, I'm going to actually speak in the light of the topic that we're talking about today, evangelism. We all know that we need to be sharing the gospel with people and lead people to Christ. Yes or no? Yes or no? But, but, but I know one thing that actually not everybody does it. I don't really know it personally from you. Maybe you're a different church and everybody's doing it. Everybody's leading people to Christ and it's awesome. But I know that quite often we don't really do it this way. And so we actually tend to actually block this truth and isolate it. For example, well, and then we're coming up with excuses. Well, you know what, actually, going to the mission trips, I don't have time. Block, boom. Well, you're like, you're helping people to understand Jesus, it's not my thing. Actually, I'm, not, uh, I'm the introvert, not the extrovert. Boom, we blocked it. Or we say, well, you know, sharing the gospel is just for the highly trained professionals and pastors and ministers and everybody who is gifted. It's not for me. Boom, we blocked it. Then we say, my life isn't just that great right now. I'm fighting a certain sin. I'm not going to repent this sin, but I'm going to block. Boom, we blocked it. Then another one said, actually, you know, there are people that actually are going to do it much better because if I'm going to say something, people will not understand or I may not know enough. And because of that, actually, I'm not going to share it. I'll just pray for people that will be sharing the gospel. Boom, we blocked it. We find crafty ways of blocking the truth. And we justify it. That's the same thing. It's not just, not, just, not just with sharing the gospel. It's many other things. You know, you take the area of your life where you're struggling with sin, and you will find how crafty you are coming up with the blocks and excuses of how not to or, actually, or how to do something that you're not supposed to be doing. And so this is why that we need to understand that is going to bring us to this point, that actually the transformation itself is a powerful thing. Because with, uh, when it comes to transformation... We need, to, we need to understand there are some fundamental truths. And let me say something. You know, I like the diversity of the churches. I really love it. Like different styles, different languages, like different countries. It's great. But at the same time, I hate the diversity of the churches. Because with all of the beautiful things of churches presenting Christ differently and uh, 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 sharing the gospel in di with different methods, you know, I hate the fact that churches present God differently. And present sin differently. These two things, you know, quite often we are belittling God and allowing too much more of sin. Or, some, or sometimes not even giving or going backwards that God is so big and for every sin he's going to send you to hell. But here's the thing, that a transformation of your mind, this statement is going to appear on the screen. A transformation of your mind is impossible without a clear understanding of who God is and what sin is. Let me read it again. A transformation of your mind is not possible without a clear understanding of who God is and what sin is. And here's the thing that quite often what we do that actually for us, God is just a small God. It's like a genie God that we're just going to rob him a little bit, do a little good thing, do a bit of the tithing, do something like that. He shows up, he comes up, he does the thing, and then we're going to put him to rest until we need him for the next time. Or sometimes we have a version of the God that is so small that we think, well, you know, we've asked for so many times and then God didn't listen to prayer. By the way, let me actually kind of bust one myth. God hears all prayers. Amen? He just answers differently. But he's not like, he's not going to say like, well, uh, that person, hmm, that person has sinned. So next time you go to pray, it's like, blah, 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 blah. I don't hear, right? It's just not going to happen. It just won't happen this way. He hears all prayers, he answers them, but probably answers them in a different way, like we want to. So this is why like, so sometimes we think, well, God is in our lives. I mean, he helped me some, but didn't help with different things. But he's helping to hold the 8 billion people that live in the world as well right now. So we think that God is really tired. 
Sometimes we have a, okay, but that we are looking at a small God. But please, let me tell you today that our God is not small. He ain't small. He is big. Amen? We believe in a big and mighty and powerful God who can do absolutely everything that he wants to do. Who is not going to be just kind of telling you like you know, one thing and telling somebody else the other. No, he's a true God. He is an honest God. He is powerful God. He's loving God. He is caring God. He is, a, at the same time, he is the, he's the consuming fire God. He is a judge as well. He, so it's all together. Don't just pick and choose the side of God that you like and call it God. Because quite often we actually, we create an idol from God by stripping certain characters from him. And we call, well, this is it. Well, our God is holy and loving. He is not going to send anybody to hell. Well, let me tell you something. Is our God holy and loving? Yes or no? Yes, he is. Is he going to be sending people to hell? Yes or no? Yes. He's not just one, he's not a stripped down version of a, of a God that you want to have, you want to pet. He's not a pet God whom you can fit a little bit and play with him a little bit, right? And then he's gonna be wiggling the tail. There is no way, absolutely no way. He's the big God who is involved in our lives, who's gonna be changing that. And here's the thing, yes, we talk about evangelism, that's the area of our lives that quite often we block and put it into an event box not a lifestyle box. And the thing is, of course we know the whole lot of methods. By the way, I love the pastor Eugene read the story about the fisherman, right? Love this story. If you missed it, like when you come home tonight, watch that again. Because we, we talk about so many different methods, I mean, how to fish and things like that, but the thing is, until you gotta go and try it, everything is useless. And so the thing is, evangelism, is an indicator of the depth of our relationship with Jesus. Nothing more and nothing less. This is why, as we're looking at this one, let me tell you something. This big God, Jesus, Christ will never agree to be an addition to your life. He wants to become its foundation. He's not, he's not going to be the God of Sunday or Sabbath or Saturday for somebody. He's not going to be like, you know, you've got a house with all the different rooms and you built an addition, an addition room, an addition to your house far away, right? In a land of far, far away. That if somebody kind of goes there, the whole building is yours. That's an addition to it. And then, I mean, the room is beautiful and stuff like that. And you were just going to walk in there whenever you kind of need to. No, he doesn't want to be an addition to your life. He wants to be the foundation. He doesn't want to be the number one. Here's the thing. May, let me bust one, one other myth. That actually, there is no such a thing as God is number one in my life. Family is number two. Work is number three. Church is number four. Man, I'm tired of these numbers, literally. I'm tired of them. I'm sick of them. Because quite often, this is what it does. Because God will give you the best and we keep the rest, right? When it comes to God, he needs to be not the number one in our lives, but he needs to be the center and the foundation of every single area of our lives. God is the foundation of the church, yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. And we come here and we pray and worship, yes or no? So family is the family. God wants to be the foundation there. Yes or no? Well, yes. So can we worship? Can we pray and worship in the family? Yes or no? Absolutely. Now, work is the place where God wants to be. So can we worship at our work? Yes or no? Well, absolutely. Can we pray at our work? Yes or no? Absolutely. Can we pray for people? Can we help people? Yes, 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 and yes. God wants to be the foundation of our neighborhoods. That's the same thing. Until we start praying to God who is big, because we often pray to God who is a stature, who is a fixed God in one corner, and then we love to keep God in one place, in one area while we're doing other things. No, there is no way it's gonna work. He says, I want to be the foundation of your life. Whether you're on vacation, whether you're in the family, where you're single, where you're serving, where you're, uh, where you're in the United States or in Ukraine or in Poland or in Russia or in Belarus or in Kazakhstan or Kenya or all the other countries in the world. 
He wants to be the foundation of it. So that there will be no place where you can go that he is not going to be the foundation of it. Because we often serve the number one, but we keep the number two. This is why Christ is never going to settle for to be an addition to your life. He wants to become its foundation. Decision making. And then every single time when you have an issue, every time when you have an issue, look at it, we're submitting to the truth. You would actually do it out of the transformed mind. Because when we submit to the truth, it may hurt and be discomfort. But here's the thing. It is better to be inconveniently obedient to Jesus than conveniently disobedient to him. Amen? That's a big, that's a big thing. It is better to be conveniently, inconveniently obedient to him than conveniently disobedient. And that takes a transformation. It takes a deep relationship. In 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You know, being a Christian is not what you, is not what you do. It's who you know. It's not about how much faith I have, but who I have my faith in. Because that God who is changing, that God who is making me a new creation, he is actually building this on a very, okay, very amazing and concrete foundation. Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, for the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer, man, this is big, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who, for their sake, died and was raised. That those who live, those, those who live, that those who live no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and, and, and was raised. Now, this is a change. God is making us a new creation for this. He's not making us new for us, nor he is making a better version of us. We're in a new creation in him. Where the laws and statutes are written in our hearts so that we can be worshiping Christ through our lives. And by the way, let me just say something. Everything is worship. Singing songs and praying together here, from here together in this place, is worship. But also, when we say the truth to one another, is it worship? Yes or no? Yeah. Almighty God said it in his word and we're doing it. You know, there is a demonic kind of worship, uh, like, you know, that uh, Almighty God said it in the Word, but demons, the Bible says in, like, in James 2.19, it says, demons believe and they shudder. It doesn't change them. They know who the Mighty God is, they know what the Word says, but they cannot be changed. Sometimes we practice demonic worship. We say the right words, but, they live, but we live differently. It's not life anymore. Remember, like, if the life is defined by the relationship, and obedience and following the, the one whom you love. You know, and because of that, okay, because of that, we need to understand that actually, you know, when it comes to this beautiful love, you know, you start living a new life when you fall in love with someone. You start living a new life when you fall in love with someone. Okay, with someone. You know, we have a couple that was here. I mean, they made a brave move. They were here twice already today, right? And then they, they indicate they love each other. Are you guys ashamed of that or no? Can you guys stand up and kiss? <laughs> because it's not time. Pastor is like, <laughs> yeah, see it. Yeah. You know what? Because it's living in obedience to Christ. Before marriage, there is no kissing, right? Right? You guys just passed. You're going to be an awesome family. Seriously. When it, when it comes to this, we understand that you cannot hide your affection. You cannot hide your love. Your faith, your faith, your, your faith is gonna shine, right? It's, it's just gonna show. So when it comes to our affection for Christ, it's the same way. 
Don't hide it. Don't hide it. You know, real life for me starts when I fall in love with Jesus, who first has fallen in love with me, not because I deserved it, but because he desired it. And again, this brings us to this beautiful Christ who is saving us, who has given us a chance to be in the relationship with him. He has provided the way. He paid for that salvation, and he builds us up. He's making us this new creation in him. So that real life for me, when, when Paul was saying for me to live as Christ, it's like, yeah, it's like I'm, full, I'm, I'm in love with Christ, but not necessarily in a romantic way. You know what, actually, I'm going to do a, just a quick spin off to the second. You know, quite often, that actually, we believe that actually, when it comes to, like, God loving us so much, we always think about the romantic relationship. It's like, like the boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. Please let me tell you something. It's going to offend somebody, but I would love to say it with all honesty and truth. God is not your boyfriend, okay? Don't flirt with Jesus. Because it's not about, well, a nice way, a nice way, do you love me, do you love me, kind of stuff. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work this way. You know, when it comes to true, genuine love, the love, that in the best way it is described, a love between the father and children. Amen? This is kind of love. So the father provides, leads, whether he feels it or not, he protects the family. Sometimes when the child is disobedient, he's got to do, right? Please cut it out. But, the, but at, the same, at the same time, you know, the thing is, he's not a God who loves punishing people or disciplining them. No, but he wants to bring us back. Sometimes it hurts men and sometimes it hurts so much. So quite often when we, when we call something like a spiritual attack, it's not a spiritual attack. It is sometimes God is disciplining us. This is why this amazing love unconditional love god loves us unconditionally and we need to learn to love him unconditionally we don't follow him to get what we want from him but we follow him because of who he is amen that changes everything that's our worship when we're faithful to each other we're worshiping when we're saying look at the truth we're worshiping when we're not stealing, we're worshiping. When we're, when we're generous, we're worshiping. Everything is an act of worship because Almighty God said it in his word and we're following it. And at the same time, sharing the gospel is an act of worship as well. So this is what, but it will only will come from this deep relationship. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. As we're looking... As we're looking at this story, let me bring you right now to Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. That will actually, will even take this message of this life in Christ and sharing about Jesus even further out. It is no longer, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been what? So I have been, help me, crucified. So I haven't gotten on a, just gonna, on a walk with Jesus, right? I've been crucified. So what's the, what, what was the intent for the crucifixion? Was anybody punished by, oh, you're going to be crucified for six hours, and if you make it, you're going to go free? Yes or no? No. So crucifixion was a single act, and you, when you're going to be put on the cross, nailed to the cross, and you're going to stay there until you what? Die. So I have been crucified with Christ. So we're dying to ourselves. Christ died for us so that we can do the same thing. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Whoa. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives where? In me. Not just with me. Not just attending me, not just having like a, like a coffee with Jesus, me, right? No, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, 
in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is not me for me anymore. It is me for him. Or in me, it is me stepping down to the, to the service, uh, to servant level and allowing Christ to take the steering wheel of my life. And what he does is going to lead us to sometimes comfortable places, sometimes not. Will you go there? If he leads. So real life, the definition of real life is Jesus, Jesus living his life both in me and through me for the glory of God the Father. You know, in the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 18, it says that nobody has seen God but the, the only begotten God revealed uh, only we got into the Son revealed it to, the, to the Father. So Christ wants to do the same thing with us or through us. He wants to live inside of us and through us. Don't believe. Don't actually lie to yourself. Don't convince yourself that God loves just you. He loves you, but he also wants to love through you. Amen? So God's love isn't just resting upon us for the sake of us. But God's love is resting upon us through the sake of other people around us so that other people can see that. God has entrusted us. And let me, let me just do a bit, a bit of a qualifier. We can see God for, from absolutely, through absolutely everything, through creation, right? Look at a macro, micro, look at a, uh, in a, uh, we can definitely see God's beauty of beauty, the whole universe. But God has trusted in most of the cases, God he's trusted his, phys, uh, his visible presence to us. Because through people, other people can experience, can experience love, right? Can you experience love through a uh, rock? Yes or no? No. So God has actually given us kind of the manifestation of his visible presence. So that we can say the, the words of love, accept, forgive. By the way, do you know that if you were sinned against, if somebody did something wrong to you, do you know that you are the only person who can forgive? Yes or no? I know it's painful. If somebody did something painful to us or wrong to us, we're the only people that can forgive. And it takes relationship with Christ to do that. He has given us this relationship that will never fail. God's love never ends. God's love never fails. It will stay with us. God's kindness will never fail. It will stay with us. So as we're living our lives right now, as you are about to actually form your new family, pray not just to be together for the sake of being together, but pray so that God would put some neighbors, some people into your lives whom you can show Christ. Literally, it's for everybody. Because we grow when we serve. Amen? We don't grow when we know. We grow when we serve. And this is why this real life is Jesus living his life both in me and through me for the glory of God the Father. Here's the thing. Here, let me just say this very openly. Real life is Jesus living his life in you and through you. That's the big story of that. God is reconciled. And if, if you have not experienced this love, let us share the words of God that are written in his word. You know, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 uh, verses 18 and on. All this from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation that in Christ God was reconcile, reconciling the world to himself. Not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us okay, the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are as ambassadors of Christ. God making this appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The, this is today is the time of reconciliation when we can grow in Christ and we can get to know him 
And here's the thing. There's a big difference between believing and loving. And this is why I'm not asking you if you know Jesus, rather if you love him. Because you can know of someone and not love that person and you will never be moved. You may know some people that live on the other side of the city or neighborhood or country, but they don't move you. But if it's the person whom you love, you will be moved. So today, the question isn't just if you know God or not, but the question if you know him, do you love him? And that's the question for every single one of us. Because if we love him unconditionally, we're not, very, we are not going to be demanding the blessings, but we're going to be following him because of who he is and what he's done as an act of worship. That's the big story of, the, of evangelism. It starts with the relationship with Christ. Allow Christ become your life die to yourself and live for him that's that's something that we need to okay grasp because that is how we can live time to live time to live this way time to live not for us but for him who is in us and allow christ to live his life through us so christ's mission on earth was very simple to do the will of the father and to seek and save the lost. That's it. He actually said it about himself. I didn't come here just to do my will, but I came to do the will of the one who sent me. So being obedient to him, being obedient to him is God's will. And Jesus wants to do the same thing through us because he lives inside of us. And the second thing is to seek and save the lost. So basically, as an act of obedience to the Father, Jesus, in Luke 19, 10, he says, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So he's very intentional on seeking, and he's very focused on saving. So for us, regardless of our like, the character or, like, or, or, like, or like, our profile, like, like, basically to as far as who we are, if we're outgoing or not and things like that, no, it, the mission is still the same. It is really the same, to seek and save the lost. And again, that will come as the result of the relationship with Christ. He will move us to the point that all of the blocks and barriers will be destroyed, the ones that we set up. And he will give us this, the strength and freedom to show him to people around us. And that will bless us as well. And this is so big. This is a different kind of life. This is not just a better life in Christ. It is not my better life, life in Jesus. It is me living for Jesus. And that changes everything. And that changes everything. And so our friends that we have, we shouldn't be just building a relationship for the sake of feeling good. But we're building a relationship and we're helping other people. And as we're, you know, we are very intentional in seeking. If you don't have friends, you know, help, you know, let us know. We'll help you to find new friends, right? A, a lot of different things. If you don't have friends, come here on Friday nights. Lots of opportunities for friendships, right? Lots of them. As a matter of fact, people are longing for the relationship. They just moved from the place where it hurt. I mean, if you don't have friends, don't just stay. Don't just say, well, I don't, have, I don't have friends. There are many opportunities to get them. Many. So this is why. Be intentional on seeking and focused on saving. Of course, we don't save. Only Jesus does. But that's the big message of this big life. And so, let me ask you a question. Will you allow him, Jesus, to continue his mission through you? Will, will you allow him to do that? And as of right now, don't go to your safety place. And start counting the minutes until it's going to be over, right? It's uncomfortable. But allow Christ to work in your heart. Remove the blocks that we've put up. And allow Christ to reveal himself to people around you. Amen? Let's pray.